So for this video, I want to start just by talking a little bit about an idea that's very complicated for students. And while I realize that this is a complicated idea, it's an idea that I want to lay the groundwork for right now. And then as the semester progresses, we're going to keep coming back to this idea. And the specific idea that I'm talking about is an idea called double dissociations. And so when we left off in class the last time, one of the things that we we're talking about was this idea of localization of function. And just to kind of catch everybody up, with this idea of localization of function, it comes from the neuropsychological uh, approach. Okay, and the neuropsychological approach, basically, what you do is you look for people that have damage to a particular area of their brain, and you see what behavior um, is a problem for them, and then that leads to the generalization that, well, that area of the brain that's damaged must be responsible for whatever the behavior is that, that you see that's impaired. So we talked, for example, about Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage, who got a um, tie rod through his prefrontal cortex. He went from a reasonably nice guy to a um, very mean um, guy, and so this led us to think that um, the prefrontal cortex is responsible for things like regulating behavior. Similarly, with patient HM, he he had a portion of his hippocampus removed, and then he developed memory problems, so the hippocampus must be involved in memory. We also talked a little bit about Parkinson's and uh, Huntington's disease, and so here we just kind of have a natural damage to the basal ganglia, and what we notice is that there are different uh, patterns of motor problems in, in individuals with Parkinson's and Huntington's respectively. And so what this neuropsychological approach basically tells us is if we see damage in this area, whatever the problematic behavior for that person is, this particular brain area that's been damaged must play a big role in whatever the behavior is. Okay, so that's the basic of the neuropsychological approach. Now this idea is something called localization of function. And so localization of function basically just says that there is a specific cognitive function or just more generally a behavior in the case of Parkinson's, but there is a specific cognitive function that's served by a very particular brain area. This brain area is responsible sp solely for X function. Okay. Now, to highlight this, we talked specifically about Broca's area and Wernicke's area. And the take-home message of this conversation was basically Broca's area is responsible for producing language, Wernicke's area is responsible for comprehending language, right? So in order to carry on a conversation with our friend, we not only need to be able to produce ourselves, um, the ideas that we're trying to express in the conversation with our friend, but we also need to be able to understand the ideas that they're trying to communicate, and that's what allows the, our conversations to flow so naturally, okay? So with that in mind, we are going to switch gears a little bit and talk about the idea of a single and a double dis dissociation. Now the thing I will say is the double dissociation, you probably heard it about it in your intro psych course, and these are basically, especially in neuropsychology, the gold standard. And what I mean by that is they are the cream of the crop. They are the golden shallot, chablet, whatever that term is, um, to really understanding how the brain functions, okay? And so this is the thing that if you have a double dissociation, you are going to really impress a neuropsychologist. And one of the things that neuropsychologists really want to do is they want to show that one brain area is responsible for one very specific function, okay? And in order to do that, there are actually two ways that we can do that. There's one way which we call a single disassociation, and that's basically saying if I damage one area of the brain, I'm going to notice that one particular behavior or one particular function is going to be disrupted and another one's going to be intact. And so that's the idea of a single dissociation. With a double dissociation, basically what we're going to show is that if we have two brain areas, each of those brain areas has a very, very specific function. So if we damage one brain area, we're going to notice one set of problems, and if we, um, but you know, everything else is going to be intact. If we damage another brain area, we're going to notice a completely different set of problems, but um, there are certain issues that won't be affected. Okay, So that gets really, really confusing, but I'm just setting out the definitions here. What I want to do is I actually want to put this into perspective of what we were talking about with Broca's area, area and Wernicke's area. So let's say that we were back in the days of Broca and Wernicke, and um, specifically we were Wernicke, 
And what we noticed is that when a group of patients came into our office, they all had damage to this particular area of the brain, and that area of the brain is just highlighted here in orange. And what we noticed that was very peculiar about all of these patients is that they had problems understanding speech. They could still produce speech for us, but they had a lot of problems understanding speech. And so one of the things that we could say is, well, clearly this area of the brain that's consistently damaged in all of these patients is responsible for speech comprehension. And we have a fair amount of evidence to say that, right? But speech is more than just the ability to produce speech, or I'm sorry, to comprehend speech. It also in, uh, needs the ability to produce speech, okay? So we have some pretty good evidence, basically with Wernicke's area and what Wernicke did as a doctor. Uh, we have what is called a single association, right? We show that damage to Wernicke's area is going to disrupt speech comprehension, but people are still able to produce speech. Okay, so that's a single dissociation, and it's one piece of the puzzle. But if we really want to make the argument that there's one area of the brain that's responsible for producing speech, and we also want to make the argument that there's an independent and completely separate or a completely different area of the brain that's responsible, that's responsible for comprehending speech, what we need to do is we need to do a double dissociation. Okay, So Wernicke's hanging out in his offices, he's noticing all of these patients, but unbeknownst to him, there's also a doctor in another area that notices the exact opposite set of patterns that he sees. Okay, In this case, Dr. Broca, Dr. Broca has a bunch of patients that come in. He notices that they have problems producing speech. However, they're still able to comprehend speech. Okay. Now again, individually, Dr. Broca has the same issue that Wernicke had. He has a single dissociation, right? Damage to Broca's area, they have problems producing speech, but they're still able to comprehend other people's speech. Now where the beauty of the double dissociation comes in is that it puts these two pieces of the puzzle together. And when we consider these two pieces of the puzzle, what we find is that they're actually two different brain areas that have a very specific function when it comes to speech. In Wernicke's area, the fact that we see damage only to comprehension but not speech production suggests that Wernicke's area is the area of the brain that's responsible or localized for speech comprehension. Okay. Similarly, when we combine that, um, Broca's and Wernicke's data, what we see is in Broca's area, there's damage to this area that they have problems with speech production, but not comprehension. So this means that Broca's area is independent, or this, <coughs> the ability to produce speech is localized to this particular area of the brain, Broca's area. Okay? So this is the idea of a double dissociation. Now, I realize that this idea is very confusing to most students, and that's fine, especially at this point in the semester. I want you to have the basic idea, but at the same time, I also want you to start kind of letting this idea simmer in your brain. We're going to come back to it multiple times throughout the semester when we talk about memory, when uh, we talked about acting and um, identifying different objects. So I want to just lay the groundwork so that you understand this concept. So. It's confusing, and that's fine if it's still a little fuzzy for you. I want you to know the basics right now. But as we go throughout the semester, we'll see examples of double dissociations multiple times throughout the course of the semester. And I think it's an important idea for you to understand, not only if you're thinking of doing kind of neuropsychological type research, but it's also kind of one of the major tenets of um, psychology and really trying to pair how a person behaves to what might be going on in the brain or what role the brain plays in um, trying to understand behavior, which is really what we're doing in psychology. So let me know if you have any questions. I'm happy to discuss this issue with you. And like I said, also hang in there. We'll come across multiple examples and keep revisiting this idea as the semester progresses.